This is the introduction to cells and the history of uh, the discovery of cells and microscopy. So we didn't even know there were such things as cells before microscopes were invented in the 17th century. Uh, the first person to report seeing cells under a microscope was a man named Robert Hooke. He was an English scientist who had um, one of the first microscopes. And when he looked at a thin slice of cork cells, here's what he saw. This is an actual copy of his drawing that he made of cork uh, of a thin layer of cork that he looked at under the microscope. Over here we have an actual model, modern day photograph of what cork cells look like and you can see from the detail of what he showed um, he saw quite a bit with his primitive microscope. The big thing is though that what cell, the cells he looked at were dead and all he saw were cell, um, cell walls from cork which comes from the inside of an oak tree. So he did call them cells because he thought they looked like tiny little rooms like the cells in a monastery. The um, person that we credit for seeing the first living cells is a man named Anton van Leeuwenhoek and he um, saw looked at pond water under his microscope. He had a really interesting microscope that he um, invented himself. looked kind of like this very small and he had there was a little opening right here there was a lens inside here he could suspend a drop of water on this little um, point there and he could use these screw attachments here to move the specimen back and forth and, and uh, closer to the to the uh, viewing window or farther away or move it side to side or up and down to see things and when he looked at pond water under the microscope he saw things swimming around and he was really surprised that there were actually things moving around and so he thought they looked like little tiny animals he called them animalcules there were a number of different discoveries of things when people started looking at things under the cell like Van Leeuwenhoek and Hook were the first ones to see these things are first ones to report it, but of course lots of other people began buying and making microscopes and looking at things. And so over the course of the next 200 years or so, the discoveries that were made led to the development of what we call the cell theory in the 19th century. Here are the three parts of the cell theory and the people responsible for them. The first statement is the cell is the basic unit of structure of living things. Um, all living things are made of cells is the second statement and it, we owe that statement to two different scientists, two different German scientists, Matthias Schleiden, who was a botanist studying plants and he discovered that every plant he looked at had cells in it. So he said all plants are made of cells. And a, a German um, zoologist or study of animals was Theodor Schwann and Theodor Schwann said that that all the animals he looked at had cells, so all animals were made of cells. And so uh, those statements were combined together in one to say all living things are made of cells. And the third statement is that all cells come from pre-existing cells. This goes back to trying to refute the idea of spontaneous generation that we talked about earlier. And this statement was made by another German scientist named Rudolf Wirchow. So these three statements of the cell theory are very important and we still abide by these today as far as, as as discussing cells. Now like microscopes like we said were first developed in the 17th century and up until the middle of the 20th century there were lots of different improvements that were made to the structure of microscopes and the optics that were used in microscopes. Nowadays most microscopes have a useful magnification of up to about a thousand times. Some of them can magnify more uh, under certain kinds of uh, conditions. The ones that we will use in lab uh, do magnify up to about a thousand times, but we'll only look at things that are magnified about 400 times. Um, one important limit to light microscopes is the resolution. That is the ability to show two different things, two nearby things as separate objects. And under light microscopes, the resolution, the limit of resolution is that you can't see things any more closely space than 0.2 micrometers. A micrometer is a thousandth of a millimeter and so that we're talking about two tenths of a micrometer or two um, ten thousandths of a, of a millimeter. Uh, 
we use various staining techniques to increase contrast and highlight cell parts of different kinds of things. And so when we look at prepared slides under the microscope, we'll see them that are different colors because they different stains have been used to highlight parts of the cell that we need to look at. Um, this is a typical light microscope. This is very similar to the ones that we use in lab. And we'll do a microscope lab in a, in a few days where you'll get to use this, but you'll see the various parts of the microscope here. You will need to know what all these parts are and how to use them um, and what they do. And so we'll talk more about that when we do a microscope lab in a few days. Now, uh, beginning about the middle of the 20th century, uh, the light microscopes uh, had reached kind of the limit of their magnification. and but with scientists needed to see things that were smaller and someone came up with the idea of using a beam of electrons rather than light. The wavelength of an electron beam is a whole lot smaller than a wavelength of visible light and so this lets you see a lot more, a lot smaller things and a lot more fine resolution, as fine as two nanometers and that's about a thousand times smaller than light microscopes can see. You can magnify things up to millions of times under an electron microscope. Uh, there are two types of electron microscopes. There's a scanning electron microscope, also called SEM, that shows great detail of surfaces of things. And then there's a transmission electron microscope, or TEM, that shows internal structures of things. Here's what they look like. They're pretty big instruments, about the size of a, of a, of a desk. But then they have a vacuum chamber that they have to... Uh, uh, evacuate the air so that the electrons, electron beam is not disrupted by particles of dust or whatever or mo other molecules in the air. Um, the transmission electron microscope on the left um, shows you internal images like this. This is a, um, a protozoan similar to a, um, a euglena, which is a, which is a single-celled algae-like organism. And you can see lots of internal structure there inside the um, the cell of this organism, and that is it. You don't see it in color. This is at, the color is added later under electron microscopes. All you see is basically shades of gray. The scanning electron microscope works a different way. It's got a, a, a scanning beam that kind of scans over the surfaces back and forth, kind of like this, and it shows great deal, detail of surfaces like this. This is a picture, a scanning electron micrograph of a paramecium. And all of those little hairy things on the surface of the paramecium are cilia that it uses to swim around or move around in the water. Both of the organisms we looked at here are little protista that live in the water. So there are electron microscopes. Now, the big question that we often ask about cells is why in the heck are cells so small? Uh, it, as organisms grow, they, um, the cells do get somewhat bigger, but there, there's a limit to which the cells can grow and that's because it's really important for the organism to maintain a uh, larger or a smaller surface area to volume ratio. If you have uh, or a large, larger ratio uh, of surface area to volume, um, if you have a bigger surface area to volume ratio that means that you can bring things into the cell or send waste out of the cell much more efficiently than you can if it's um, if the cell is bigger and we'll look at this in lab and talk about it some more when we talk about the cell membrane and about cell division. The plasma membrane is another term that you'll see for the cell membrane and the, the, the function of the membrane is to form a boundary between cells and their surroundings. It's made of a layer of phospholipids, a bilayer of phospholipids, a double layer and there are proteins embedded in it. Uh, we often call the plasma membrane a fluid mosaic. Um, those phospholipids, remember, have hydrophilic heads that uh, mix well with water, and they have hydrophobic fatty acid tails that are not nonpolar and do not, stay, do not like water. And so the hydrophilic heads face outward, Exposed, exposed to those solutions of the cell and the cell and the fluid the cell lives in and the hydrophobic tails face inward and they help regulate what comes into and out of the cell. We're going to spend some more time later on talking about the cell membrane in more detail. We're just talking about generalities now as part of the cell. 
Here's kind of what it looks like in, in a cartoon type drawing. We have the hydrophilic heads on the outside and hydrophobic tails on the inside. Here we have outside cell and inside cell, both are watery environments. And then there are various proteins that are embedded into the into the phospholipid bilayer that allow certain things to move into and out of the cell and they're um, there for cell communications and so forth. So inside the cell there are some contents that are all the same in every kind of cell there is. All cells have a cell membrane as we just mentioned. They all have cytoplasm, sometimes called cytosol, and it's basically a jelly-like fluid that contains the cell contents. It's a, a watery solution with lots of different things in, in, uh, dissolved in it, lots of proteins and uh, salts and other kinds of uh, molecules that are necessary for the cell. All cells have chromosomes or have DNA in the form of chromosomes. And, and the pr function, of course, of the chromosomes is to uh, control the processes of the cell. And then all cells also have ribosomes, which are the protein factories of the cell. And we'll talk a little bit more about these in detail as we go along, but these are just some things that all cells have in common. There are two main kinds of cells, as we've discussed before. There are prokaryotic cells. Uh, prokaryotic comes from the Greek prefix pro, which means before, and karyos, which means nucleus or kernel. And the prokaryotic cells have no true nucleus or any other membranous organelles inside them. This is mostly bacteria. They do have DNA. It is in a, a region of the cell called a nucleoid rather than the membrane enclosed nucleus like we see in eukaryotic cells. They have ribosomes, but the ribosomes are smaller. They have a cell wall outside the plasma membrane. And sometimes they have some other um, structures attached to them like pili that are for attachment to surfaces or flagella for movement. Uh, prokaryotic cells generally are much smaller than eukaryotic cells. They're about one-tenth to one-hundredth the size of eukaryotic cells. Quite a deal smaller. Here we ha have a micrograph of a bacterium and then here is a generalized diagram showing you the location of these different structures um, in the prokaryotic cell. Eukaryotic cells, U means true, okay, have a membrane-bound nucleus and they have other organelles uh, that do special jobs within the cell. There are four main groups of organelles. Um, here they are listed and we'll talk about each, I'll talk about them term. We have the nucleus and ribosomes that are involved with genetic control of the cell. We have what we call the endomembrane system, which is involved with the manufacture and distribution of molecules and, as well as their breakdown. We have the organelles involved with energy processing, including the mitochondria and chloroplasts. And then we have the structures that are there for the support of the cell, including cytoskeleton and the membrane and the cell walls. Here we have a generalized animal cell. This is not any specific kind of cell. It's just a generalized animal cell. And it shows you the basic layout of the cell. We have the nucleus which is has a nucleolus, a darker area there, contains the DNA in the form of chromatin. Um, you don't see the chromosomes except during cell division. We'll talk about that later. We have the nuclear envelope, which is a double membrane that surrounds the nucleus. Um, right around the nucleus, outside the nuclear envelope, is the endoplasmic reticulum, both rough and smooth, that are involved in uh, the production of molecules in the cell. We have the Golgi apparatus over here on the right, this uh, stack of membranous sacs over here that is involved in packaging and modifying proteins. Um, we have mitochondria that are involved in making energy for the cell. And most plant in animal cells, we have these two barrel-shaped centrioles that are involved in controlling the, um, the cytoskeleton of the cell. And we also have lysosomes, which are um, sacs of digestive enzymes for breaking down um, food particles and worn out cell parts and things like that. Most plant cells don't have citrioles or lysosomes. Another organelle that we have, see in, in both animal and plant cells is called a peroxisome that's involved in breaking down harmful compounds. You see ribosomes both on the rough ER as well as in the cytoplasm here. And then this shows some of the cytoskeletal components, the microtubules, intermediate filaments, and microfilaments that are involved in maintaining the structure of the cell. In the plant cell, a lot of the same things are there. Plant cells generally have a, a large central vacuole that helps um, control the cell, helps uh, maintain the cell's shape. 
uh, plant cells have uh, animal cells don't have smaller vacuoles, but they don't have this large central vacuole. Uh, animal cells also do not have chloroplasts, which are involved in um, in uh, photosynthesis. Uh, animal cells don't have a cell wall to maintain the exterior structure, but all of the other structures that we saw in the animal cell are present in the plant cell other than those particular things.